Okay, and then slideshow. Okay, so I'm talking about the Phonal Isotopes database. And at this point, you know, I've used up all the words like mobilizing and past and present and future direction. So growing, I went with is my title. Um, so, and, you know, so here's one of the slides that I just modified last minute. Jack's updated. Um, you know, we have neotoma growing by the day um, now. The last screenshot I had of this was from like October and there's like 2 million more observations from like October 21, let's say. So that's a lot. Um, in comparison to the sort of overall coverage of neotoma, this is the coverage that the Faunal Isotopes database has. Um, so we're up to 59 sites with 98 data sets. And the reason for that sort of mismatch between site and data set is essentially every um, isotope database that gets uploaded also has a specimen level uh, vertebrate data set, you know, that goes along with it. Um, on average, uh, the sites contain about 20 to 50 samples, some a little more, some a little less. Uh, one of the unique issues with the isotope data, I think, is that the nature of this research, a lot of times people are going around to different uh, projects and kind of harvesting samples, if you will, for the isotopic analysis. And so unlike, you know, your kind of traditional pollen data where you have a site and you, you've looked down core and you have lots and lots of data for one place, um, a lot of the isotope data is, you know, somebody went around to like, you know, I'm guilty of this too, but <laughs> somebody went around to three or four different projects or sites and did like, you know, uh, 10 samples here, 20 samples there, 30 samples there, and then is, you know, making some um, argument. So for instance, some of these North American sites, there was a project that was looking at dog isotopes. So then you have uh, one paper that has five sites with three dogs each or something like that. Um, so this is where I think the, you know, I get excited about the possibilities of the bulk uploader to kind of help deal with this issue of um, individually, uh, you know, uploading each, putting in all that information for each site for then like two pieces of, of data, right? Um, so in total, uh, though, I don't think this is, you know, too bad in terms of our growth since uh, 2020, we entered the North American sites, we had about 25. And so um, in the last like year and a half, uh, we've doubled that with, as you can see, this smattering of sites in the Mediterranean. Um, and as Jessica mentioned in her talk, uh, you know, and I just said, like, some of this is also um, including adding that specimen level data, like just the, the vertebrate data first, and then the isotope data on top of that. So um, one issue that I see with that is we are kind of, um, you know, there might be a site that actually has a much larger vertebrate fauna data set with specimen level information, you know, maybe there's like 200 or 1000, uh, you know, records associated with a site for the vertebrate data. But then there's only, again, like, you know, 50 isotope data points. And so we're kind of, we're only entering the specimen level information for, for samples that have isotope data. So we're kind of uh, artificially maybe constraining what would be a, a, a larger data set for the specimen level um, vertebrate data. And so that's an issue that we've kind of been grappling with and discussing, you know, should we be then doing due diligence and entering all this vertebrate data too? Um, but obviously that gets into issues of time and, um, you know, just having people to do it. So a little overview um, on sort of, you know, the, the timeline. Oops. Sorry, all the Zoom things are like, <laughs> I can't see my stuff. Uh, in terms of a timeline, I mean, some of this is old news. This is like the original formation of the database, but I know there's some maybe more recent people here, whatever, it's been a long time. So starting already um, almost 10 years ago, the Stable Isotopes in Zooarchaeology Working Group was formed as part of ICAS, uh, the International Council for Archaeozoology. And we started working with Russ, um, and talking with Eric about, um, you know, having a database and time has gone by, the database exists. 
Uh, we had a working group meeting in 2016 where Eric actually came and sort of, you know, told everybody how to enter data, but things were still very squiffy at that point. Um, by about 2017, it was possible to actually enter data. Um, and so in 2018, 2019, we did we had this North American focus and that was done by 2020. We were hoping to have an in-person workshop and get a lot of people you know, entering data. Uh, but of course the pandemic um, messed that up. And so we ended up doing an online workshop showing people how to enter data. Um, it went relatively well. I think you know over 100 people signed up, of course, because it was Zoom. Uh, but we still had about 60 people attend, which I think is pretty good for a virtual um, several hour meeting. And um, you know, we went through that workshop. There was a lot of excitement and energy. And as part of that, we developed a template for entering data. Um, there was also a lot of liaising during that time with other isotope databases that came about. So there's IsoArc. ISO Memo, ISO Bank, uh, but also a few zooarchaeological initiatives like ZooArcNet and Futures uh, that we were also talking with, as well as this group um, focused on ancient Near Eastern isotope data. So lots of kind of, I guess, discussion about cross-pollination um, and collaboration, you know, during that time of not being able to physically be together. In 2021 and 2022, we focused on this data entry in Europe and the Mediterranean, really in an effort to broaden, you know, the, the database kind of uh, profile beyond the, the North American data. Um, and so that's why you see that kind of like bias with North America and, and the Mediterranean and nothing, nothing else. Um, we haven't really had a lot of uptake despite uh, communicating with people and people being generally enthusiastic. And I think, you know, the reason uh, why has in part to do with some of the data entry and data retrieval challenges I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, but I did want to highlight, you know, some of the things that that got done besides the online workshop. I gave a couple of virtual talks about the database. Uh, there was a book chapter in this book on um, isotopic research in zooarchaeology that talked about the North American data set that came out in October 2022. And then the Stable Isotopes and Zooarchaeology Working Group did meet again. Um, I used to lead that group, but now it's been taken over by uh, Roz Gillis, who's um, in Berlin. And so she hosted a really great meeting in Berlin that I unfortunately couldn't make because it was right in the middle of our semester here. Um, but they did also disseminate information. There was a flyer that went in every attendee's bag with information about the database and how to access the template, you know, um, information about becoming a steward, reaching out. And so hopefully there'll be some, um, you know, I don't know, interest generated from that. And I'm also hoping that as a result of this meet this week, um, as well as the Pharos meeting that takes place in May, there'll be some forward motion. Um, I have a student that's continuing data entry, but really the goal is to maybe synthesize some more of this data towards uh, research and see if we can, help, you know, use that as a way to get more data entry going. And then also the International Council for Archaeozoology is meeting for the first time since 2018 um, in Australia this summer. So I'll also be going there and going to the, the isotope working group meeting that takes place within that meeting. Um, and, you know, again, trying to recruit entry and talking to people about it. Um, in terms of the data entry challenges, um, similar to some things that other people have talked about, but one of our big issues, you know, obviously there's always a bottleneck um, with data entry in terms of speed, but one of the big issues that, again, Jessica mentioned in her talk is that specimen level data entry is just extremely buggy in Tilia. And so uh, even when we kind of think we're done, we've only just begun. <laughs> Uh, so there's a lot of errors that we have to go back and correct and deal with before we can even like get to the isotope level data. Um, and the other thing is we are still only able to do specimen level um, bulk samples. So you have like a bone and you have carbon and nitrogen data, fine. Uh, but there's an awful lot of data out there that's serial data from tooth enamel that, you know, I myself generate and just also coincidentally, a lot of the people that kind of overlap with this neotoma community generate. Um, so I, I have a feeling like if we had that serial data capability, that would actually help bring in more people um, in terms of data entry, because that's like a really big want um, 
from from people who want to use the database and like sort of other the carbon and nitrogen people are like less gung ho about it if you like um the other kind of barrier aside from the data entry challenges which i'd say are more experienced by us on the steward side right because we made this template so it's not necessarily some of these bugs are not necessarily visible um to other would be data um suppliers but really the biggest problem that i see that you know is not going to be a surprise to some of you is this issue of once we put the data into neotoma it's sort of unintelligible uh, on its way back out so here's a screenshot of this site uluru uh Hoyuk, that i uh, generated the data for myself so i actually analyzed the bones and you can see here um you know, so there's the site name and description and everything. Okay, fine. When we actually go to the samples tab, we have here uh, the carbon nitrogen ratio, the carbon and nitrogen uh, data, but they are listed here instead of, you know, whereas we would want it to say like deer, you know, like uh, deer femur, right? It's just giving us like this, this uh, sample, oops, sorry, this sample ID. And so that's true for each um, value. You don't actually know like what specimen it's tied to. So even though we've gone to this trouble of entering the specimen level IDs for the fauna, you know, red deer, left femur, distal portion, and then an isotope value that corresponds to that, you can't actually get that information as an end user. And so for me, when I'm trying to convince people to enter their data in here, that's, I think, a big drawback because it's sort of like, well, why am I going to enter my data into this database when I can't actually, um, you know, see it properly in Explorer? So that's kind of our big, I think, a big issue um, in terms of getting more um, participation in data entry and uh, use. Because in general, people are enthusiastic, but then there's very little follow through. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, we have, you know, uh, kind of carried on with data entry. Um, trying to show people that it, you know, it functions um, and that it is exciting. Um, but I feel like, you know, with a, with a few a few adjustments, a few of these tweaks, we really could sort of meet those expectations. So anyway, I'll. That's really all I have to say. Um, and you know, just thank you to everybody who's been involved along the way. And my two students, uh, Matt Varis and Natalie Moss, have done a lot of data entry and a lot of um, working with Tilia to, to get this data up onto it. So I'm grateful to them as well. But yeah, thanks. Thank you, Susie.